Welcome to Pedagogical Practices and Universal Design in College Economics, Teaching Diverse Learners. This webinar is sponsored by the Morgan Le Fay Center at Landmark College. Our speakers are Dr. Manju Banerjee, Vice President for Educational Research and Innovation and Director of Landmark College Institute for Research and Training, and Dr. Oscar Harmon, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Connecticut. Audio cast quality is subject to your equipment, available bandwidth, and internet traffic. If you experience unsatisfactory audio quality, please use the telephone dial-in option provided in your confirmation and reminder emails. If you have dialed in, operator assistance is available by pressing zero pound. You may send questions at any time by using the chat window located to the left of the presentation screen. A question and answer session will follow the presentation. I will now turn the call over to Dr. Banerjee. Please begin. Thank you, Virginia. And good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. We are excited to share this webinar with you, and we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to delve right in. Um, what you see, uh, the slide in front of you, is our roadmap for this webinar for today. I'm going to briefly start by talking about the changing post-secondary landscape and then the framework of universal design, and in particular, universal design for learning, or UDL. I do want to say that there are several iterations of universal design in the literature, but for the purposes of today's presentation, I'll be talking about UDL. Next, Dr. Harmon will talk about the application of universal design practices in college economics, particularly in the online platform, something he's very familiar with, and will share his ex expertise as an economics professor and we will have recommendations for best practice interspersed throughout our presentation. After my session, we'll take a question or two, and then we will leave time at the end uh, for more questions from the audience. So, let's look at the post-secondary landscape and the profile of students coming to college today. It's quite different from even a few years ago, and definitely different from a decade ago. An interesting statistics here, 70% of college students today have at least one characteristic of what can be called non-traditional, such as being enrolled as a part-time student, or caring for dependents while being a full-time student, or working full-time while enrolled in college. And these data are from the National Association for Developmental Education Resolution 2010. Clearly, diverse profile is the defining characteristic of college students today. Now, in this webinar, we will focus on diversity in terms of learning needs, particularly for students who have a learning disability, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or autism spectrum disorder. So that's going to be our focus. But let me start by making this discussion real. What I'd like to do at this point is to invite you to think of a student you might be familiar with, one who is or has been struggling in your class. Now, as you know, there can be many reasons as to why a student may not be performing up to expectations. And as I've indicated on this slide, it can be due to poor attendance, uh, work not turned in on time, low motivation, attitude, so on. And though I can't see it, I can feel several of you nod your heads. Um, as faculty members, we can see and comment on observable behaviors of students. And we can even hypothesize about the cause of the behavior. But we don't really know exactly what or why a student is struggling. Students really come to us at very different entry points into the learning space. And it can be difficult for faculty to understand individual learning abilities and needs, particularly for an increasingly diverse population. What we see is attempts to accommodate individual differences can quickly become overwhelming for faculty. So let me invite you now to think about teaching and learning framework that suggests moving away from accommodating individual differences 
to universal design. Universal design for learning, as described by Dr. David Rose and his colleagues at CAST, Center for Applied Technologies, is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insight into how humans learn. It helps redirect our attention to create a learning space that is flexible enough from the start to support and scaffold differences in abilities, background knowledge, pace of information processing, attention, etc., all of which we know are the basic ingredients of how we learn. So how do we learn? The brain is one big integrated network. It is a dynamic ecosystem. And for simplicity, we will think of three different groupings within that network. And I do want to say you have the reference there on the slide. This is not something I invented or I'm talking about from um, a primary resource research, but this is out there in the field. The research reference for this is CAST, C-A-S-D, Center for Applied Special Technologies. So the first are the recognition networks. The recognition networks of the brain address the what of learning and help us identify and interpret patterns of stimuli from sound, taste, light, uh, smell, touch, etc. So the question arises, what can instructors do to scaffold pattern recognition? Information that is presented in multiple ways can facilitate pattern recognition. And this, in fact, is the first principle of universal design for learning, namely multiple means of representation. Now, there are many examples of multiple means of representation that faculty can use to encourage the recognition network in our brains of our students. And one example of best practice uh, grounded in this principle is providing multimodal access to information. And you'll hear more about that as Dr. Harmon talks about his research and his experiences. Now, the second set of neural networks are the strategic networks. Strategic networks have a different anatomy and a different function. These networks help us plan for action and for taking appropriate action based on the plan. Much of this happens in the front of the brain, which is the executive function region of the brain. And the strategic networks are really the ones which help us plan, execute, monitor, regulate, so on and so on. And we do know that many students with LD and ADHD have particular difficulty with executive function abilities. Now the network that forms, this network forms the basis for the second principle of UDL, namely multiple means of action and expression. Activating students' strategic network can be done by including supports and cues into the instruction, such as organizers, timelines for assignments within the syllabus, multiple options for assignments, such as oral, written, and so on. So once again, uh, it's up to the instructor to determine how they want to facilitate the strategic network, learning network, in our students. The third neural networks are the affective networks. Now, the affective networks enable us to engage with a task, and it influences our motivation to learn. The affective networks guide emotions and our mindset towards learning. This is the why of learning. And as we all know, when we can get students to buy into why I should learn, more than half the battle is won. We have managed to successfully engage them. Easier said than done, right? But this is the third principle of universal design, namely the principle of multiple means of engagement. And examples for activating the affective network include choices for learning tools, such as allowing students the option to use a camera or to use video or text in completing a task or options for self-regulation and self-monitoring, such as allowing students to turn in a draft before the final paper. 
And the best practice here that is being supported by the research is practices that promote intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. I do want to say that uh, the extent to which an instructor or faculty member wants to facilitate these networks and engage in these um, and application of these principles is up to you. You decide what makes sense for my particular course. So it is not a dictate, even though I'm calling it and I'm calling it guidelines, and that's exactly what they are. Now this slide and the next slide are more examples of effective practices anchored in the UDL framework. I'm not going to go into details here, but these will be posted on the Morgan Le Fay site, the Morgan Le Fay Center site at the Landmark College website, and you will have access to these slides even after our webinar is over. Uh, let, me, let me do this. Uh, show you the next slide here, and you will see all these examples of effective practice. And then what I'd like to end by saying is that the undergirding of all pedagogical practices here at Landmark, which is only one of two colleges in the entire country that exclusively serves students with LD, ADHD, and ASD, so the undergirding of all our pedagogical practices is universal design. Now as we incorporate universal design practices into instruction, we of course have to make sure that we are continually assessing student outcomes because that is what makes us be able to say that this practice is research-based UD evidence. And I also want to add that universal design is not a checklist of to-dos. What is really at its core is our mindset to be proactively thinking of ways we can reshape our learning space to incorporate diverse learning needs. This fall, uh, coming fall, the Morgan Le Fay Center at Landmark will partner with Dr. Harmon at UConn to conduct a national poll of economic faculty around the country to gauge their understanding and application of evidence-based practices. They may not call them universal design, but we'd like, we are very interested in finding out what our faculty, particularly economics faculty, uh, using uh, in their classroom with this diverse, growing diverse population of college students. Now, um, I will see if there are any questions, and if not, um, Question about um, transcript of the captions be available later? Um, yes, it will be uh, when we post this on our website. And there's a question about um, concerns about curriculum being or the syllabus being watered down uh, if we follow universal design. This is a common question that I've encountered before. And as I said earlier, um, the way an individual faculty member uh, decides to incorporate principles or practices of universal design is guided by his or her uh, understanding of what is important and the goals are for that particular course in his class. So you decide, and if you think, no, uh, I don't want to give a student the opportunity for five drafts. I want to give them an opportunity for one draft for their term paper. Um, that's your call. Uh, I have another question here. Um, what do faculty who teach economics use? Is it the same rubrics? Uh, I'm going to, uh, Claire, I'm going to hold on that question because I know Dr. Harmon's going to address that. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to switch over to Dr. Oscar Harmon. Thank you, Manju. And thank you very much for attending the webinar. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts and experiences as I've been teaching online uh, and using the universal design uh, and quality matters approach. Um, 
I've been doing this since uh, for about a decade and a few years, and so um, I've encountered, uh, learned a lot, and I appreciate again the opportunity to share it with you. The um, the outline of what I'll do today is uh, talk briefly about the online challenge, how learning learners are different, and the literature comparing traditional and online. Then I'm going to uh, delve into the Quality Matters uh, rubric, and then talk about uh, instructional design as I've been using it and implementing it for my online classes. And uh, so I'll talk about videos, gamification, and social media. And looking at the, uh, about the online challenge, uh, Thomas Friedman has been a prolific uh, columnist in this area. And uh, he's uh, definitely a devotee of MOOCs, and he feels they have a bright future. And uh, he's cautioned us that uh, we need to take up this gauntlet and that uh, online uh, instructors will be eating the lunch of face-to-face uh, -face instructors and that uh, and standing still is, is not an option. And I agree entirely with the last part, standing still is not an option. But I do see there's uh, uh, challenges in implementing the MOOCs, and um, the the fervor behind them has died off a little bit because of the challenges. And I think though that we'll be able to rise and surmount those challenges over time, which then brings me into uh, just a brief talk about the history of distance learning. That um, we've had correspondence courses for quite a long time, uh, and um, the, uh, there has been some work done on them. Um, let me just see here. Yes, and so we had a report in 1928 uh, from uh, Oklahoma about their courses and their, uh, in their summary about uh, the, their assessment, they concluded that most uh, administrators and faculty were concerned about work done in absentia. Uh, and what they were talking about was that they uh, recommended that no credits being given for courses taken by students that were never in residence at the university and that none of the required courses be worked this way and that uh, if there were credits being given that they needed to be in a proctored final exam or the words that they would use equivalent to that back then. And so there, uh, there's been a concern about uh, all along about whether online courses are legitimate or not. And um, the, um, also, uh, uh, um, we did have uh, radio in the classroom came sort of after that. And they kind of saw the role as the instructor in one uh, way of looking at it as de minimis, that all they did was select the broadcast and so forth. But there was also concerns in this radio and the school report that um, uh, this radio may well eventually report, uh, replace individual teachers, and that, um, that uh, there was also nothing, uh, one quote was, there's nothing educationally worthwhile on the radio. So um, we've seen this, uh, this concern for the content of online and also this fear that it's going to take over everything, but we've also seen this very optimistic view that um, uh, um, uh, Thomas Friedman has, has shown us. And um, so the view out there, I think, of MOOC advocates is this time it's different, that we really will see a revolution. And um, part of that belief comes from a U.S. Department of Ed report in 2010, which surveyed 1,000 studies, uh, research studies. And what they concluded was, after reviewing these, that online is a effective as face-to-face -face instruction. But what we see when we look at the literature on uh, economics classes, there isn't uh, such a justification for uh, such optimism that um, the three studies I have here, Brown and Lightham and uh, Grant, Grant and Lavoie and Stanley, uh, are strictly about economics classes. And they find that face-to-face um, -face time makes a difference, and courses that are strictly online, students don't do as well on a uh, final exam. And we have this recent report from Ewan Yeagers looking at community colleges, and this is across the board two-year students, uh, across the board um, courses, and they also find a similar result. 
the um, most recent literature uses randomized trial experimental uh, approach to research studies, and they find uh, that uh, live-only instruction dominates Internet instruction. And there's uh, three of them here. I, uh, my, I was on a team that uh, just produced one of these and found the same sort of results. So we have to uh, be very serious about using, I think, the Quality Matters rubric and uh, if we're going to have equivalence. And so what they stress in there is that the online courses need to have clearly stated learning objectives. There need to be a set of interactive activities that engage the student, and there needs to be concern for accessibility so that you pull the students in to the class, uh, and that's part of the engagement. But what they definitely uh, uh, state is that just taking a course and putting it, uh, using your uh, PowerPoint slides and putting them up, that's not going to uh, lead to a successful outcome. And so what do I do, or what have I found that's successful? What, I, what would I recommend? Uh, to someone just undertaking an online class. So my practical tips are to definitely construct the course to be consistent with Quality Matters standards, that um, using short videos uh, for course content, uh, designing them around the principle of gamification, which I'll describe, and using social media to communicate with the students. And throughout these three principles, uh, they should be set up in a scaffolded way so that it promotes independent learning and time management. So let me show you how I do this in a class. Now for the videos, I'm there, uh, the point of these videos is to uh, convey the uh, content of the, uh, the course content. And uh, what I use in my videos is I'll take a PowerPoint presentation, but then I uh, beef it up by uh, making the diagrams animated, and then I uh, add an audio overlay that's closed caption that explains how the animations work or explains the slide. And then on these, I have uh, navigation bars so that students can chunk it out on their own, that they can go through uh, uh, the, um, the video, which is uh, the flash PowerPoint, which is probably about 30 minutes. Uh, they can go through it at their own pace, and they can stop it, come back to it later. So they, the toolbar down here is, is um, where they have, uh, I divide it up into five chunks usually, and then they can go through that. Um, and then these diagrams, they uh, are clicked through at a pace that allows them to follow it, and the audio overlay follows the clicking through of these diagrams uh, have curves added to them. Now, the, um, what I think is uh, also rec uh, a good idea is to put in this uh, strong drill-down capability so that uh, students can find what they're looking for if they've been through it and they need to go back, or if they want to chunk it out and go through it in five-minute intervals. So I have as a normal PowerPoint uh, in these uh, converted uh, PowerPoints, they have thumbnails where they can choose them. There's also the outline. And then there's a keyword search where they can uh, type it in and find out uh, uh, where this term is defined if they have a question as they're reviewing for an exam. And I think the, uh, the key thing, or one of the very key uh, principles is putting this on so that it's available on a mobile platform. So it has to be moved or put in HTML5 so it can play on um, uh, iPhones, smartphones, as well as Android devices. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, students, millennial students, that, that's what we're talking about, and um, as uh, a baby boomer uh, instructing them, we're not so acquainted with how they uh, learn. 
Uh, but if you look around, you'll, you know, and you're looking at a millennial, uh, they have their iPhone or their smartphone or their tablet. And if they're not using it, it's because they're in motion doing three things already. But uh, normally they're only doing one or two things, including their texting and so forth. And uh, so you'll notice that they, uh, these are pictures of students or, you know, adult learners that are in different places and they're learning. Uh, they may not be doing uh, a course right at the moment on this, but that's my goal is that they will take my course and they will uh, learn, uh, uh, listen to, watch my videos and, and uh, while they have time, free time, because they're commuting or doing other things, rather than uh, just uh, Facebooking with their friends and so forth. Then, um, so the gamification part, that, uh, the way I use that term is that it's a way to, it's that my homework assignments and assessments are interactive. And so they are, um, I have them paced uh, through the course. I'm uh, teaching a three-week course online now, and we cover a full semester in, in that time period. That's the way it's done. So they're working almost every day. We're going to have a three-day weekend break over Memorial Day. So um, we've earned it at this point. But uh, so these assignments occur with a great deal of frequency, and that's part of the gamification is that they'll see a test or assessment and exercise every day that they're taking the course. And they're done in a way that it's uh, almost the same. The format uh, is, is about the same so that they know what to expect. And uh, they're done in a formative way so that um, they become increasingly more complex as they go through the semester to build on what they've learned. And if they haven't learned it, then they have to go back and, and relearn it to, to move ahead. And I give them a scorecard uh, to keep track of uh, what their progress. And uh, it's in an online Google Docs that I share with them. They save it to their uh, Google account. And then they fill in their grades as they go along. And it's set up to uh, then, uh, with an algorithm, forecast what their grade will be. And so if they're, uh, you know, falling a little behind, they realize what they have to do to catch up. Uh, and um, they have uh, proctored exams at the end. I have one final proctored exam. And all of this uh, is uh, kind of reinforces or built along the idea of independent learning and the time management. They have to meet these deadlines, so they have to manage their time. So the way I think of this is kind of like the X's and O's. That would be one sports metaphor for this, is that the course in the lecture content is to teach them how to do this stuff. And then the assignments and so forth, the assessments are doing it. And they're, uh, it's set up so that the uh, initial assignments are just a quiz, and then it builds up to a exercise, which I'll show you shortly, which they have to then um, synthesize what they've learned and apply it to a, a real-world problem. So the, um, where I do this real-world problem synthesis higher level of learning is in my graphing exercises. And in the graphing exercises, they're done in a uh, shared Google Doc. Uh, and I use the, uh, the draw tool in, in, in the Google Suite. And I give them a initial diagram, as you can see here. Um, and so then I've drawn, you know, basically the, uh, the grid for them, labeled it, and put the initial supply and demand curves and labeled those. And then what I ask them to do is I give them a problem. You might not be able to see that one, but it's, this one's about um, airlines and how they had a price shock, and that shifted the supply curve back. And then um, there was also a uh, change in demand due to a recession, and so demand fell. So I have them uh, walk through this, and I have a, uh, a grid, uh, rubric for them to say, you know, did you show this, did you show this, did you show this, so that it's sequenced for them already. So if they just follow the, the X's and O's that I give to them, uh, like this sort of thing, then they can produce uh, this diagram at the end. 
and then um, what I do is uh, release that diagram uh, right after the, the deadline is, is there, and then they're uh, encouraged to self-assess as well as uh, look at my grading of it. And I find um, they, they do enjoy, well, many students do enjoy this. Then um, the next thing here is just that uh, to show you briefly what the scorecard looks like, and they fill in as we go through all the different sessions what their grades are. And also when we get, we have three exams, the hourly exams, uh, and uh, so each third of the, of the course is set that way, and then they get to I drop the lowest score. And that way, again, uh, keep their interest in, and also uh, many students do worse on the first one because they're just not comfortable with the online course. So giving them a chance to retry it as part of that gamification type of thing, approach. And then we use a, uh, uh, the online web service ProctorU, which uh, there's several out there, and we've been through uh, several different ones. And I'm not sure why we switched. They all seem very, very good. But the uh, students can sign up for a, a, a time that they're proctored over a webcam uh, and their uh, computer's locked down. And uh, that way we uh, have quality assurance about uh, that it's independent, um, independent product that they're, they're sending to us. And they have to, of course, show their ID and so forth. And in many ways, I think it's more uh, proctored in a sense than, than, the, uh, than when you have face-to-face -face proctoring with a large number of students in a room and one person watching all of these. The, um, they, have, you know, uh, they have one uh, person monitoring these, but they have everyone's monitored individually, and they have a whole matrix that they're watching the, these students with. The, um, the last thing that I uh, think is very important in this um, uh, approach to, um, to teaching is that uh, Social media needs to be used for communication. I, I know that uh, our CMSs like uh, Blackboard and um, Angel and uh, so forth have built in them a, uh, a bulletin board and uh, an email system. But for, my, for me, I don't find that really engages the student as much as the, the social media does. That uh, Facebook is what I use for my discussion groups and then uh, for my teleconferencing uh, for office hours, I'll use Google Plus or whatever the, um, the system is that we have. We seem to change that as well. But for me, it's, it's Facebook that really creates the, the engagement with the students of the tools that are available. And um, what, what you can do or what I do in there is uh, moderate my discussion. So I set them up so that I'm the only one who can post the, uh, the message. They can all comment on it when I make the post that they comment on. And then I moderate the discussion uh, by uh, responding or sending them an article or two to, to uh, comment on. And um, the, um, I try to use it to promote uh, Bloom's tech taxonomy in the sense that um, some of the questions at the beginning will be very basic definitional, and then others will be like that uh, uh, graphing activity where I show them an article from the current Wall Street Journal and say, you know, can you see how this reflects or what do you think would be uh, what we would recommend based upon the principle, for example, the, uh, the higher minimum wage that was just passed in L.A. by the city council. What do you think based on what we, we've been looking at with these supply diagrams and price floors, what do you think will be the, uh, the, the impact of this? And another reason for using this uh, social media Facebook tool is that um, our students, our millennials, are multitaskers as well. And so they're doing a thousand things at once. And they like being, at least I find that some of them like being part of a conversation. So that uh, if they have a moment to check their Facebook, they'll check their friends, but they'll also check my course. And so they don't really have to uh, be, you know, have uh, so much concentration uh, to do that because this is what they do anyway when they're on their phones with their friends. So they could just, they don't have to respond, but they could see what the conversation's about. And uh, walking your dog isn't really that, you know, I, I guess they, I can't do that, but I, I, I do know they do that. And some of them, you see them with their bicycles and then, 
you know, certainly uh, just eating at a cafeteria or a cafe, Starbucks or whatever. But the more troublesome is uh, if they're on the job performing or if they're driving. But, again, this isn't something that we can uh, change their habits, uh, but it's something to indicate that they're constantly doing this. So why don't we try and trick them into learning by uh, uh, capturing them when they are in these moments of doing this? And uh, this is just an example of how I do the uh, the social media. So, um, uh, you know, the basic introduction. And then uh, I do have um, uh, TAs that work with me at on times. And uh, so this is just an example of how uh, you can tag somebody so they will get an email notice that something's going on. So even more of a reason to, to uh, tag into the course. So this is my approach to how I teach these, this material. And uh, so I put up uh, Steve Jobs here, but the idea is that uh, he created this device for us and we can use it as teachers. So um, I know we do have online classes, but I don't know that we really think of them as being right on the tablets or that if we do, I, I endorse that. And, uh, and I, um, uh, and I think that having them on the tablets and, and smartphones, we can have the entire textbook because we have um, the uh, digital textbooks. Uh, and I use a, a, a homework service as well that has direct access to the textbook. And then with the quizzes, if they miss questions, it refers them to the sections in the textbook that will help them out so they can answer it uh, uh, correctly next time. And then, as I've indicated, I put my lectures in that sort of uh, flash type of, but in HTML5, so it can play on the mobile devices. And what I also like to do is to put in my uh, presentation so when they click through it, that if that there will be questions there that they'll stop the presentation and ask them and then show, uh, give them a right or wrong and encourage them to answer the question correctly before they advance to the next part. And um, that's part of the scaffolding uh, approach that uh, I think helps out. And it's also part of the gamification because then they know that uh, they're being tested. And they're also given a chance to do it again so they're not discouraged. They're just simply at the game and we'll go through it, we'll find the answer, and we'll move to the next level. And um, the, um, the Facebook is what I use for the, uh, that. And I do use Twitter on some of the classes, and I find some success with that as well. And finally, uh, the scorecard is what, um, to me, helps them uh, be on top of things, helps them with their time management. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering now is if anyone has put any questions here. And I do see this one about Facebook. And <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, do you ever experience resistance uh, with students who do not have Facebook, do not want Facebook? And then that's true. Um, I, it's older students. It's the baby boomers that will do this, that will say this. And um, they've had different uh, bad experiences with uh, social media. And uh, they have a much better understanding of the dangers of social media than do the uh, millennials. So I do two things about that. One is that um, I also, when I have a student that's indicated that, I will make more of an effort to put that material in the announcements in the CMS. And so that, and I will also encourage them to email me privately. But to the extent that I have discussions on Facebook wall, I put them, try to put them in the uh, announcements so they can uh, participate as well. Um, and, and, but again, it's like one out of 20 students whenever that happens. And then, um, but also, I, I respect that, that point of view. And so what I will do is give them, and I think I have a slide here for this, uh, give the millennials uh, or my students that are just, that are using Facebook, I went, uh, that I use with them, I give them a, um, yeah, a, a lecture or a, uh, let's see, how am I going to get to this? Well, I can't seem to pull that up here uh, with this. Um, it seems to be locked in. But I have a lecture on privacy settings. And uh, I'll, um, I encourage them to uh, 
make sure that their uh, personal pictures are only released to their friends and uh, and things like that, because they, uh, what they do there is uh, what their potential employers will see, and it's independent of the class. I think it's a very important lesson. And then how are the hourly exams uh, timed for an hour? If so, yes, yes, absolutely. That in our CMS, uh, the question was, how are the hourly exams timed? Are they timed for an hour? And if so, do you accommodate students for extended time? And the answer is yes, that uh, in our CMS, we can create exceptions so that uh, based upon the, um, I have documentation from the uh, our Center for uh, Students with Disabilities and they have an accommodation extended time, I give them exactly what that is and the CMS adjusts for that. And the, they're timed by the, the course management system to go for an hour. So when they log in, it goes for an hour and then they, uh, their time is expired. Okay, I don't see any further questions and I don't know if I've missed any. Uh, Manju, uh, do you have a recommendation for any other questions that have come up? There's just one question. We talked about um, universal practices and what do faculty who teach economics use? Is it the same rubrics? Is it the same as yeah. rubrics? Yeah, I would say that the the um, the answer is if they go through the uh, design process at our eCampus, which has a team of instructional designers, then they have to use this approach in that they have to use quality. They don't have to use the details like I've done in that way, but the general idea of accessibility and time management, laddered, scaffolded, clear objectives, yes. Uh, so the same sort of framework. But but if you design your class independent of them, then I have, you know, that's sort of what we would be looking for when we do this national survey. What because not all institutions have a team of instructional designers to do this. And we really only started this four or five years ago at the university. So um, I'm not sure if we're ahead of the curve or just at the curve, but I'm sure that a lot of uh, instit post-secondary institutions don't have a budget for that. Oscar, if I may just add one thing. There are several more questions that are directed specifically to what you just talked about. Uh, but I, I just wanted to add that uh, while you're hearing Oscar talk about gamification and the use of social media and mobile devices, uh, as you can see in what he talked about, there are still app these are still applications of the multiple means of representing information, multiple means for expressing what students know, and multiple ways of engaging. So, while he may not exactly be using the same language of universal design, it is the core principles of universal design that you're seeing manifested in uh, many of the exercises, activities that he does with his economics class. And um, I see there's, there's a question about how are the security settings set uh, because you have privacy issues with uh, grade private privacy. So the, um, the, what I spoke about were the security settings or privacy settings for the Facebook, but also when uh, we have hourly exams and for the final exam, we have a lockdown that uh, program in our CMS so that when they enter the exam mode, the other parts of their computer are frozen out and they can only uh, click on the uh, the exam itself and the responses. Um, and so we use the Blackboard uh, uh, CMS and that's, and so I'm not familiar with the type of security settings in others. Um, and then there's a question about can you explain gamification a little more? And um, so the way I envision the gamification working is that the students have multiple attempts at um, completing an exercise or problem, and that it's uh, that the problems escalate or they're scaffolded, so they become more difficult as they within a session or as they go through the course. And um, the other part of the gamification is that they um, are are uh, done on a time schedule, so there's pressure for them or 
this learning management is enforced so that they have to do it and complete it, that task by a, uh, a date and time. But with our CMS, we're, it, we can set it up so that they're told about the deadline, and then if they miss the deadline, they still have access to it, and then um, they can still submit it, and then I uh, can give them, uh, I can, you know, give them full credit or take some points off. But what I find is that having a deadline really gets them doing it, and that uh, penalizing them really, I don't do that because I find that they send in a note of apology, or they've only missed it by 20 seconds, or things like that. And uh, or they've had some difficulties with just technical with uh, getting used to how the course works online. So I find what really works is just telling them there's a deadline and it pops up. And then when they miss it, it kind of they realize that and they self uh, correct for it. Oh, that's a good question. Do you ever use alternative methods of exam format for? No, but I have heard of that. I was just talking to somebody who uh, mentioned this oral exams and mentioned how for some papers that an instructor uh, will grade the paper but do it in a short video. And so I'm thinking also that, that that sort of got me thinking about this oral exams and with these type of uh, graphing exercises to have them in a video explain what they've done and use that rather than write it out. I think that's a great question and uh, so I haven't but I think it's a uh, I think it would be a good thing to do. So and I'll then, uh, jump in here. I've used so students could hand out a paper, it's like a term paper in one of the online courses I was teaching, and or they could present that information in wiki spaces as like a mini website, if you will, that they've created on the content where they can drop in YouTube videos, they can drop in animation, etc. So for students who have difficulty writing large term papers, that's an option that students really appreciated. So again, alternate that's format great. for assessment. Yeah, and that Wikispace is, isn't that complicated to set up and work with. Um, uh, so it's very doable as an instructor to create that. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, how does Blackboard link to social media is a question it doesn't. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can only put, and that's that's one of my gripes about uh, Blackboard that it just hasn't made that advance yet into integrating the social media tools. Um, and I'm not really familiar yet with uh, how uh, Google does this with the Google Chat, but I understand from some people that are experimenting with them that the Google Suite has more social media built into it than than Blackboard does. I don't see any more questions. No more questions. I, I didn't know if you wanted to uh, address your slides on Google Draw or some of the other. Actually, that, yeah. The, um, le now, let me just see how I can skip through to that. Okay. So I've clicked it, but is it I'm, not, I'm not getting it to uh, – Is okay. That's it. It was just a little slow. Okay. So – here is what I have for how I set up the Google uh, Draw example. And uh, so you can see what I have here is the uh, on the left-hand side, uh, I have a, a graph where um, – so I'll put in the, uh, the diagrams for them. And uh, sometimes I just have one or I'll have two in the, in the, uh, in the problem. So they could show a market – the focus firm and the market, or two separate markets. And um, so then um, this, these, the, I, I do give them directions, uh, what it is the problem that I want them to do, and then I also give them a rubric or a step-by-step -step how to tackle this problem. Um, and uh, then I also ask them to write out an explanation about it. So um, then what I have next is a uh, – oh, let me just back up. And so then with this, once they get it, uh, they have a link to the diagram. It's in Google, and then they just uh, – it's shared with them. So then they copy it to their own account. There's a uh, – up there on the uh, navigation bar, there's a file menu, and then it says copy to your account, basically. And that way they can take their own copy and do – 
what they're supposed to do without uh, changing the template that everyone else is looking at. And uh, But also, for me, if there's a change that has to be made uh, on the fly, I can just change that one template that's up there in Google without changing everybody else's and redistribute it and so forth. So I could just make that slight change and put uh, an announcement out there that this has been changed slightly for whatever reason. Um, so that's a real convenience of, of, use, you know, of using the cloud or an uh, example of how powerful that cloud is. And then, um, so then the, here's, you know, an answer that I give to them uh, right after it's due. And I find that, that they kind of like that. And, and you can set it up so that, in, at least in Blackboard, that it will also uh, display the answer at a certain time period in the announcement. So that's kind of also uh, fun in the sense that uh, it takes away some of the passivity from it. They don't have to go and look for the answer. It's right there in the daily announcement. Then um, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, okay. This is something I had a great deal of fun playing with. Uh, and you, and I, you can do this as well in a face-to-face -face class. but. To take variations of that graph and uh, then have them identify uh, which is the correct graph, and you you know obviously you can make these simple or very complicated, so they can't get the right answer without uh, spending a fair amount of time on them. But um, I, I I find that that does engage them for a couple minutes, and uh, again it's sort of part of the gamification that it's a challenge and. Uh, you know, and it's a low stakes one, so then they have to identify it. And, um, you know, if they just done one of these graphs recently, it, it's uh, easier than if you give it to them also later when they're reviewing for a test that's got four chapters on it, then it takes a little more time for them to get into it. So that's what I have on the graphs there. Uh, and do we have any more questions? You had some uh, interesting slide uh, or two on why not to use social media. <laughs> yes, that uh, actually that fits right into the question about uh, about using social media and the uh, and the uh, older students that were uh, more uncomfortable and and like I said, some of them just I you know weren't going to do it, so uh, we had workarounds, but. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, the topic of why why not to use social media that's very legitimate because the students are out there and they're carrying on their personal lives there. So uh, uh, they have this phenomenon called the creepy treehouse effect, where that uh, you know you have the adult looking in on their personal life and they themselves are. Uh, are uh, not happy that that adults are intruding and the the instructor is intruding on their personal life so that that's why i uh uh a motivation for uh giving them uh information about privacy settings and for uh strongly encouraging them to think about that and um uh indeed uh I have seen at some universities where they do have as part of their student orientation encouraging students to be more familiar uh, about how the internet can have adverse effects and how they can't be so naive about it. And um, so this, this also, that sort of lecture ties into that, that strain of, of their education. Um, and um, the, uh, the students become distracted on Facebook. Um, uh, that's also a line of thought that um, you're not uh, you're encouraging them not to pay attention to in the classroom in a sense the online classroom, and of course we have instructors. I'm not one of them, but I know that a lot of instructors uh, feel uh, uh, that it is a, you know that they must tell students they can't turn on their uh, their smartphones uh, during class because that distracts them, and. Um, I guess my take on that is that um, I completely understand that, and um, I'm, I wouldn't discourage any instructor from doing that approach. But um, but for me, I, I'd rather try and trick them into learning, and and so I'd rather try and find a way to have them use that device when they're in class to learn things. So that that's one of the reasons that um, I find a tool like Poll Everywhere uh, useful because then I have them. Uh, voting on something or I have them responding to this 
And I know there are other innovative techniques out there to use uh, this for um, exercises uh, in class uh, that you can have them not just uh, post to a poll, but they could post their work. Uh, and that's what I do also is have them post their work after they worked as a group on a, on a Google Draw, have them post it to um, the um, discussion page, and then I show them at the end of you know, the 15-minute period, here are the, the three or four that we've used. Um, uh, or that we uh, that the answers that uh, students have come up with. Arthur, um, if, if before we get to the next question, because I know we are getting to the end of our time, I, ju I just want to add that for many of our students with ADHD, they actually need to be multitasking to be able to focus. So uh, in a face-to-face -face class, a student, you might see a student doodling, but what they are really paying attention. Or you might see a student um, kind of tapping their feet, but they are paying attention, or even with their head down on the table, uh, which are often misinterpreted uh, by, by faculty as being cues that they're not paying attention. So uh, again, uh, the, the premise that there are multiple ways to engage students and being open to this multiple ways to engage them uh, is, is something that uh, sometimes we don't think about. So um, thinking uh, from the perspective of students with LD, ADHD, um, it's interesting to think of how, particularly gamification, how they can be really involved with um, in the class and see that as a challenge and get involved in a way that in the past we wouldn't have thought about. I agree. I, I think the, we uh, have time for maybe... There's another, another question about uh, Facebook as a group or a page. I set it up as a group, and then it's um, private. I let them join, after, and then after the first week, I make it a secret group so that um, nobody can see it but uh, the participants in that group themselves. Um, and um, so then how do you create scorecards? In Google Sheets, and I find it easier to work in uh, Excel and then convert it into a Google Sheet. Uh, and and because I found Google Sheets somewhat, uh, not, just not that comfortable with trying to program in it, but with the but it will convert any Excel sheet you create. And how do they automatically? I put in the uh, an average grade. I'll put in a B plus, and so so that's how I fill in all the spaces, and then I encourage them to right over that to put in what their actual grade is and they could change it from an 85 what they expect that's what i put in they could change it to higher or lower and then change the algorithm so that that way it's very simple for them to change the algorithm and uh, that's about it i see there yeah um great series of questions um i think it was wonderful uh sharing this experience with you uh, oscar um I know we're at the end of our time for this webinar. Uh, I do know we will be continuing this type of webinar series in the future, so stay tuned, as they say. Um, but I think um, unless you have anything to add, uh, I just want to thank all our participants and um, really share uh, this excitement of learning together as we are seeing more and more diverse students come in to college and also dealing with different learning platforms and spaces. And I reiterate that. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's nice to be working with a group of people that share the enthusiasm I have for this. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the webinar, a post-conference survey will appear on the window behind the web presentation. Your feedback is important to us, so please be sure to complete the survey. If you have closed the survey window, a survey will be emailed to you in 24 hours. This concludes today's Landmark College webinar. Thank you all for attending.